So the first part of this course was uh, taught by Dr. Madhun that has been covered now, completed now, I believe. And uh, the second part that is uh, more on of advanced analysis, you can say. Um, the class schedule is as given here, Monday 10 a.m., Wednesday 9 a.m., Thursday 11 a.m. Um, again, this is a tentative uh, grading schedule. Um, exam will constitute about 30% that will take place towards the end of this course. Um, again, based on the consensus, I can uh, change these marks. I will not change these weightages unilaterally, but based on the consensus, if the majority of you wants to change this thing slightly based on um, uh, how, how much time you had to spend or how much, uh, how, how difficult it was to participate or um, give time to any of these components. And you might think that this component should not be given this much of weightage. We can uh, take a relook. Anyway, so there will be a project which will be a programming project. So you will be required to do some programming. Um, have all of you some experience with the, uh, with the sorry, MATLAB programming? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Many of you have no experience with any kind of a programming? No, sir. I had, sir. Okay. Okay. So there are quite a few who have not done any programming in the past. I would strongly recommend that you find out uh, from various sources, from your friends, from your seniors, how to get MATLAB installed on your computer. Okay. Um, form a group. Try to find out. The institute had some licenses. I, I'm not sure whether those licenses are still valid or not, and whether we have students have access to that. Please explore that, okay? And install MATLAB on your computers because you will be required to do MATLAB programming. If uh, there is no other language, I mean, maybe Python can can be as simple as MATLAB too. But even Python, I'm I'm not 100% sure. I've never done programming in Python. Uh, if you if you decide to do programming in any other language, let's say C, C plus plus whatever the amount of effort will be multifold. And uh, in fact, I'm going to share with you a, uh, a kind of a, a sample program code in MATLAB. So the, that program is written in MATLAB. So it will be easier for you to add on to that program. Okay. So that's why I would strongly suggest that you figure out how to get MATLAB to work on your computers. Okay. And work quickly on that. Fine. Um, there will be several assignments and quizzes. I'm still trying to figure out the format of assignment quizzes because earlier it used to be all classroom based uh, quizzes and assignments take home. But uh, now we'll have to see how to how to go about that one. Quizzes, of course, cannot be, uh, I mean, online quizzes uh, are very difficult to conduct because many of you may not have a very stable internet connection. So it will be mostly take home type of assignments and quizzes that we will see. But these two things, assignments, quizzes, and project, these will be paid special attention. And uh, if you, given the number of hours required for each of these and uh, do a proper reading uh, after each class, I'm, I'm sure you will find enough, uh, uh, like, like you, you will do well in this course. And uh, my basic information is given here. My, mobile, my phone number doesn't really matter. I mean, you can always write an email to me. Mostly I respond within a day or so. Sometimes it may take a couple of days. If you don't hear back from me within a couple of days, um, maybe I forgot to reply. So just send me a reminder about any queries that you may have. Okay. Uh, the textbook here, Weaver and Gary's textbook will be used for the matrix method part. But again, I will be mixing the content from various other books. Um, and I'm sure you can find this book very easily. Um, I don't, I won't tell you where, but I'm sure you can find this Weaver and Gary textbook very easily. Uh, you can also buy it. It's not very expensive. I suppose three, four hundred rupees. I think. Um, then there is uh, Devdas Menon's book. There is Hibbler's book. So Hibbler's book will be used more uh, rigorously, more frequently in the initial discussions. So, and I'll go into the course content soon. Um, so mostly it will be Hibbler's book or the Viewers and Gary's book. Okay. And then there are various other books which will be taken. Concepts will be taken from there. For example, when it comes to structural stability. Uh, <coughs> So I'm not going to talk about structural stability in this course, but there, when we go into nonlinear analysis of structures or analysis of nonlinear structures, uh, at that time, uh, some concepts of structural stability will be applicable that we will discuss, okay? Um, as far as course content, content is concerned, today's class is mostly an introduction class. 
next four classes almost four or five classes will be a very basic recap of uh, um, how to calculate forces in a determinate system how to calculate deformations in a determinate system deflections and deformations in a determinate system um, then we will spend a few lectures uh, three lectures or so on the force method of analysis which is also known as the flexibility method of analysis okay uh, we will do some examples on um, plane truss and i think we will do example on plane frame or beam i think but we will not probably do examples on space trusses and space frames um th these two topics will be too much, will take too much of time this kind of examples will take too much time then we will try to move to the displacement or stiffness method of analysis as soon as we can so but this is important just in case some of you have some uh, lack some kind of a basic background information because this is kind of a foundation work first four topics marked here these are more of a foundation work then the displacement method of analysis is basically built on all of these and then we will try to spend a uh, sufficient amount of time so that you get good understanding of that then the displacement method of analysis uh, this topic itself first the fundamentals then the transformations and then the direct stiffness method so how to develop the direct stiffness method then we will do some examples using matlab and uh, uh, i would recommend you to compare those results with sac 2000 so or stat pro so i think we have i had uh, for the other course that i just completed teaching uh, advanced steel advanced steel design there i had just shared the information about stat pro so the same information you can use here i'll share that information with you again so i'm getting a phone call all right uh, then the last topic will be uh, of the on the analysis of non linear system so i'm expecting about five lectures uh, that will go into that so which will include newton raphson's method of structural analysis and then other types of some methods we will be discussing that okay so uh, these are very basic initial lecture initial discussions i don't want to spend too much time here uh maybe quickly uh, somebody can tell me what is the role of structural analysis in the so when we are let's say building a building okay so we are designing and building a building structure where will be the role of structural analysis can somebody quickly go over the life cycle of this building design and in what step is the analysis used Can you tell me all the steps? Yeah, Leo. So in the uh, structural analysis part, for before before designing, we are required the structural analysis because in the structural analysis mainly we are finding the force demands, mainly the uh, constant loads, uh, the moments, and the displacements that are happening in, within the spans like that. Mainly, mainly the demands which are happening in the Correct. Uh, structure. So exactly. with that. we have to design for the corresponding demands we have to design with the appropriate member sections like that correct very good so basically the the what is structural analysis in uh, in particular uh, basically structural analysis when we say what we mean is that for the given external forces right so this could be the dead loads live loads uh, wind load earthquake load thermal loads whatever so for all these forces that are external forces we try to get the internal forces okay So these internal forces would be your bending moment demands, your axial force demands, shear force demands, and so on. So um, torsion demands, and as well as the displacement values, deformation values. So we try to get, when we that particular step uh, where we translate the external force values to internal force values, that part is called analysis. How about calculating of stresses? Is that analysis too? so from the internal forces let's say you get a bending moment demand from bending moment demand you can also calculate the stresses is that also a part of analysis typically anybody sairaj want to say sir uh, we may call it as a analysis part like uh, in rcd we may do Yes, but do see we may call anything anything, but do we do that? Do we call it analysis? 
I mean, uh, typically in RCT, we'll do that. No, sir. I Means from moments we, we may find the stresses that are present in the uh, moments. Uh, then calculating of the reinforcement, for example, you are talking about RC. So calculating of the reinforcement will that be called analysis? No, sir. Uh, it, it's called <laughs> as. Uh, okay, that's where you are drawing the line. Okay. <laughs> yes. No. Uh, okay. So uh, no. So actually, calculating the of calculating of stresses from the forces or internal forces. See, when I say internal forces, it's a generic term. It means actual force, bending moments, torsion for torsional uh, moments, shear forces, everything. Okay. So from internal forces to stress value calculation, that is also covered mostly. I'm not saying universally, but mostly it is also covered within the design. Okay, so let's say you pick up IS 800 or you pick up IS 456. What do you need to give as an input into that provisions or in those formulae that are given in IS 456? You need to give force values, and what you get is so you need to give force demand, and what you get as a result of that thing is the force capacity. Okay, so. From force to stress transformation, that part of translation is taken care of during the design phase. Okay, so analysis is basically softwares typically. Nowadays, what is happening is that these softwares, STAD and SAP, they are getting more and more into design domain also. And that's why for a designer, sometimes it may be confusing or it may be kind of a all um, metamorphosized that you have uh, analysis and design all mixed together. But in your mind, you should have this clarity that calculate, calculation of internal forces is an analysis. And that point onwards, how is that internal force translated into the stresses? And then you do the stress checks, right? And that's where the, that is the, that entire process is designing. Okay. Okay, sir. Um, types of supports, type of members, free body diagrams. Free body diagrams, I think I'll spend some more time, but types of members forces, this is all obvious to you. So this is the life cycle of a designing process, right? So architect develops a concept design, loads are estimated, member sizes are assumed first by the architect, and then some kind of analysis is done by a, by a designer, okay? Or by an, by an structural engineer rather, okay? And then the stresses are calculated, deflections are calculated, and then the entire designing is done. Okay, uh, member element types of structural members. You may have tie rods, which are purely tension members, which may use rods, bars, angles, channels. You may have columns, which may typically be made of I sections or channel sections, etc. Um, you may use them as beams as well. So beams could be simply supported based on the boundary conditions. And then there may be some combination of beam and column. These are the typical type of structural members we may have. When I say tie rods, also there may be struts. I forgot to mention struts here. So tie rods are primarily in tension, but similar kind of members, which are primarily in compression, but they are not typically called a column, are the ones that are called struts. Okay. Different types of loads, dead load, live load, um, wind loads, earthquake loads. You can go through these details. I'm sure you are already familiar with. So what is very important here is for you to know which codes to go to to find out the values of different codes, uh, different types of loads. So for example, 875 addresses live load and wind load, right? 875 part one, I think, uh, deals with dead loads. I, I'm not sure. Uh, part three definitely deals with wind load. Part two, I suppose, deals with live loads. Again, I'm not 100% sure, but um, I've kind of forgotten it's been a while. Um, earthquake loads is not in IS 875. Which code addresses earthquake loads? 189. 189 part one. Yeah, so 1893 part one addresses live uh, earthquake loads on building structures. Typically, if you want to do other type of structures, let's say water tank, etc., then you have to go to different versions of uh, different, uh, not versions, different parts. So there are part one, part two, part three, and so on of IS 1893. <coughs> thermal loads, there is no specific code for thermal loads, depends on what is the source of thermal loads. Um, for fire, there are separate codes, but that may not always be the case. Vibrations, small load, impact, explosion loads. These are some of the more advanced ones. Implosion and uh, impact and explosion kind of a load. Uh, different types of boundary conditions may exist in a structural system. Typically, when we are talking about different types of connections, particularly, not so much boundary conditions. Um, between beam and columns, you will have uh, 
these two typical connection details. Okay, uh, one is a pin support, the other one is uh, one is pin support, the other one is fixed support. Okay, so the pin support typically looks somewhat like this in steel. Okay, you have a column, you have a beam, and the web of the beam is connected to the column. Okay, only the web. The flanges are not typically connected. When that is the case, you will call it a pin type of support. I mean, of course, it is very very uncommon to connect this whole thing through a single bolt. Here, what you can see are the two bolts are there, right? So when we are using two bolts, it obviously is not purely a pin connection because when the two bolts are there, they have to be separated from each other. When there is a gap in between, that means this, this uh, connection is not going to work as a true hinge. After certain amount of rotation, these bolts will start offering a resistance against rotation. Okay, but uh, what will happen is that the force demand, whatever is coming from here, will not lead to a very large moment demand. Okay, because the lever arm is relatively very small in comparison to the overall uh, cross section. And therefore, these can be idealized as pin supports. For concrete members, pin supports are rather uncommon. Okay, there may be sometimes uh, such possibilities, especially let's say you have two towers. And then there is some kind of a bridge of something of uh, of that sort that is provided. Then you would typically have this kind of a pin support, okay. And it is not it does not always look like uh, this uh, cylinder being placed here. It could be just that it is resting simply with some steel plates in between or some kind of a bearing in between on that. Uh, in which structures do you see pin supports more often, even in concrete? In buildings, it's very uncommon to see a pin support. <laughs> so in bridges, sometimes we put bearings here, which could be elastomeric bearing, or it can be pot thing. What is it called? The pot uh, uh, steel bearings with a pot, which allows the rotation. Okay, I, I I've forgotten the exact name. So rocker kind of bearing. Uh, broker bearing. I don't know what it is. Uh, rocker, rocker, rocker bearing. Yeah. So so rocker is basically just uh, something which allows the uh, rocking movement. Yeah. Um, now, what I'm saying is like what kind of material they are made of. So they could be made of elastomeric kind of a material, or they could be made of steel also, Neo which allows this kind of a rotation. Yeah, sorry. Neoprene so, bearings also. There. Neoprene bearings. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so various types of bearings are used to develop this um, kind of a pin pin supports or kind of a system, which allows some lateral movement as well as rotation here. Okay, so if it is a pin support, it should not allow lateral movement, and if it is a roller support, it should allow lateral movement too. Okay. Um, then in steel, in steel rather, it's much more common to have a pin support like this, and it is uh, only when you definitely, definitely need a fixed support, you go for this kind of a connection where you uh, where you connect the columns of the sorry the flanges of the beam to the column okay so you, the detailing looks somewhat like this you can see the you can see this picture here right so the top flange is welded to the column the bottom flange is also welded to the column because there is this additional support provided near the flange in concrete however this kind of a detailing is much more common where you get a full fixed connection or a rigid connection okay uh, what is essential for concrete is to extend this rebar intention side so that if this member wants to bend this way it should be this rebar should be in tension and once this rebar goes into tension it should offer sufficient lever arm to develop the moment demand okay so because concrete is more of a monolithic kind of a construction uh, rigid connections or fixed uh, restraints are much easier than in steel these are the different ways where uh, how we represent these different boundary conditions. Okay. So a roller could be represented like this, like this in a structural drawing or not, not the structural drawing in a, in a, in a exam assignment problem. Okay. So when you are doing the analysis, typically we may represent these boundaries or supports in this way. Okay. So rocker also means a roller support. So these are the different ways of showing a roller. So even though you, here you can see that the roller gives an impression that if you apply a vertically upward load, this thing will simply lift off, right? But that is not what it means, fine? If I apply a vertically upward load on this one, it will not simply lift off. It is restraining the vertical movement 
in the downward as well as upward direction. Okay, then there can be ways of uh, marking a pin. There are ways of marking slider. So a slider is uh, will be shown typically like this, wherein the vertical movement is allowed, and what other movement is allowed? So it's a it's a plane frame system, right? So in a plane frame system, you are allowing a vertical movement, but you are not allowing a horizontal movement, and you are not allowing any rotation. Then you would typically show this kind of a boundary condition. Okay, and fixed, of course, you are familiar. All three movements in a plane frame system are restrained. Okay. Now, free body diagrams. Here, this discussion is very important to understand the difference between uh, the external forces and the internal forces. So, and the sign convention that comes with it. Let me see. So, before I go into that, maybe we can do a few examples. Now, typically, I like to do it in a more of a classroom setting. Let me see how we can do it here. So let me uh, put a question. Okay, I have this block of wood. Okay, it is resting on a resting on a flat table. It's a horizontally flat table. Okay. Now, can you draw a free body diagram, all of you, on your notepad, on your notebooks, if you have a notebook with you? Can you draw the free body diagram of this wooden block? The mass is M. Are you drawing? Can somebody show me? Uh, you switch on your camera and uh, put that paper in front of the camera so I can see. Uh, let me see. Okay. Yeah. So there is mg and there is some n value. What is it? What is it at the bottom? Uh, the resolution is not very high. I can't hear you. You have to. It's a normal, sir. Uh... Normal reaction. Okay, fine. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who else? Okay. So I mean, he already showed you. I I suppose you have seen already. I don't know what what you could see. Was there everybody able to see him? Yes, sir. Okay. So here I am showing both forces uh, slightly off, but actually they are acting. They should be acting right across each other, right along each other, uh, in the opposite direction. So there is normal reaction. There is mg force. Okay, so the mg force will be acting at the centroid, wherever the gravity centroid of this block is, and the normal reaction will be acting at the bottom surface. Right? So if it is a 3D block, so the normal reaction will be acting at the bottom surface of this thing. Okay. And they have to align perfectly. If they don't align, what what will happen? Eccentricity. Yeah. So because of the eccentricity, what will happen? Moment. Moment, moment will be generated. Right. So unbalanced moments will be generated. That will that they will make the block uh, going to a spin. Fine. Perfectly all right. So. How do you know there is this N? See, Mg is there because Newton told us that Earth pulls everything, correct? With a force which yes. is proportional to its mass. That's what Newton told us. So, and we put our, our faith in Newton <clears throat> and we say that, okay, Mg force will be acting on this block that will be acting downward. How do you know that force N is acting on this block? Uh, 
by Newton's third law, sir. Okay. So what did Newton's third law say? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So Newton's first law say, first law said. It said that, uh, no, sorry, that's not the first law, what I'm saying. Newton, separately, he told me, not as the first law, sorry, I, I withdraw. So, Newton told us that Earth pulls everything. In fact, everything pulls everything. That's what Newton told us. But Earth also pulls everything, which is by a force. That is proportional to okay. this is the sign for proportional to the mass of that thing. Okay. Okay, so that was one. The for Newton uh, for getting the normal reaction, you are saying that Newton told us that there is third law. The third law said there is a reaction to every action. Fine. And of course, it's equal and opposite. Right? That's what you are saying. So, yeah. So, how do we get? So, mg was figured out from that, from this part. We figured out mg, that g is that coefficient that Newton talked about. But then from mg, how do we get to n? Who had uh, mentioned Newton's third law just now? I, I couldn't catch your name, so please tell me. Who was it? I could not see the screen at the time. Hello. Come on. <laughs> you can tell me your name at least, right? Who, uh, who mentioned Newton's third law? OK, if you want to be quiet. All right. Uh, anybody else? How do you connect from mg to n using Newton's third law? Sir, by uh, balancing the vertical forces. By balancing the vertical forces. But that is not Newton's third law. Sir, Newton's second law, f is equal to m a. Yes. So where is a here? G, sir. G. Second law said F is equal to M A. And uh, instead of A, uh, I sorry, Indira, right? Yeah, so she's saying instead of A, we will use G. What is A here? What is A? Acceleration. Acceleration, right? But yes. is this body accelerating? No. So should oh. we use a non-zero value for A here, which is, she's saying you should use G. And by the way, we are trying to figure out the value of N. And even with Newton's second law, how do we get to the value of N? So Newton's second law does not seem to be very helpful here. And Newton's third law also is not directly, I mean, uh, can uh, I mean maybe there is some role of Newton's third law? It seems, seems to be matching perfectly well. There is an n force which is exactly opposite of mg, and Newton's third law is also talking about a force which is exactly opposite of mg. So, is that n the reaction force that Newton was talking about here? Anybody? Yes, sir. It is the reaction by the graph. So this is the reaction that Newton was talking about in his third law, N. How many disagree with that? Nobody disagrees with that? Everybody agrees with that, huh? Sir, I disagree with that, but I don't know what's the right thing. Okay, so on what basis do you disagree? 
So actually, in in our undergraduate, uh, one sir taught that, but I just forgot that thing. Actually, he correctly okay. taught. But I was okay. searching notes. Uh, which, get... which college was it? It's, uh, it's, uh, so not 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 my uh, undergraduate. When I am at coaching, uh, when I go, okay. went for coaching, it, it taught. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah. That is actually a much better place to learn these things. <laughs> Institutes. He's correctly taught that thing. I just forgot that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Search. See, uh, these things. Why am I emphasizing so much on this one? Is because I have seen PhD students confused about internal forces versus external forces. What is the sign convention? What sign convention to be used? What is the meaning of internal forces versus external forces? And that is like you know that stays with you later on. You will become a very famous engineer, and you will always be nervous in your mind. <laughs> That somebody brings up the issue of positive moment versus negative moment or positive reaction, shear force versus negative shear force, okay? And how do you answer that? So that's why, and all that requires understanding of what I'm talking about right now, okay? That's why I'm spending so much time on this one. I would rather jump much quickly to the stiffness method of analysis. I'm sure all of you know how to do that already, and you would be happy to spend more time on that one. But still, I'm spending much time here, okay? So because interaction on online mode is relatively cumbersome i would rather uh, move forward quickly okay so mg part we had established which was not from so mg force is not coming from the from any of the th three laws that newton had proposed it is a separate law which was law of gravity rather right where it said any two objects which have mass m1 m2 they are attracting each other because they have masses, right? And that is the law of gravity. And it was force was the mutually, the mutual force that is acting between the two bodies is m1, m2 divided by r square multiplied by a coefficient, okay? Then if I'm looking at this one as earth and this one is my body, that block m1. So whatever happens to m2, r is m2 g by r square all these things become almost constant because my distance from the earth center is not changing earth's mass is not changing and g value is anyway universal constant so all of this is called small g okay so that's how you get this force acting on this body so the force was force acting on this body was mg this is a separate law it, it was proposed by Newton, too. but this is not one of the three laws that Newton, that the other three laws for which Newton is famous. Now the role of the other three laws starts. Newton mentioned, and the first and second law, are, the first law is basically a special case of second law. Okay, so uh, as Indira had mentioned, force as per the second law, right, force is equal to ma. And now my this bo this block that I was talking about, I know for sure that there is a force acting mg, okay, and that mg has got nothing to do with the acceleration. That is the force that is coming because of the mass of the Earth. The Earth has so much mass that it is applying this force mg on the body on the block, okay. Um, then, okay, let me put one more question. Then I will explain again. This block, let's say I have lifted this block. This is the ground. I have lifted it by 10 meters in air. And let's say there is no air, okay, in vacuum. I've lifted it by 10 meters and then I drop it. It is dropping, falling under gravity, okay? So when it is falling under gravity, at that moment some, somewhere along the way, what is the free body diagram? Can you draw the free body diagram of this block at that time? Virendra, you were pretty quick to draw that one last time. Please draw it and share with, with us again. Everybody can see him? Yes, correct. Everybody could see him, right? Thank you. So there is a force Mg acting downward. And there is no other force acting on this body. Right? So between this one and the previous one, what was the difference? 
we don't know in the previous one that, that there was an, an acting. But what we could observe in the previous case, this is the first case, this is the second case. In both cases, we know for sure that force mg is acting. But in the first case, we saw no acceleration. But in the second case, we saw acceleration. Fine. So since we didn't see any acceleration, what we have to say is that this A value is zero. That means my force has to be zero. But I have got one unbalanced force of mg. That means my net force or total force has to be zero. That is mg plus then there must be something else. And that is my n. Okay. And that, I mean, you can call it minus n rather. And that n must be coming from this surface interaction with the table. In the second case, however, my F is equal to mg. This is the force acting. Okay. And, and of course it is accelerating and I can measure that acceleration. That acceleration is not zero. It is a non-zero value. It is a finite value. And from there I get that my acceleration is equal to G. Okay. Okay, so this is the implication of Newton's first law. So from the Newton's first law or the second law, first law and second law is basically the same. Only first law is a special case of second law. So you get the n value. Okay, everybody agreed? This is how you figure out there must be an n, 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 which is reacting or which is opposing mg because the body is not moving body is not accelerating that there must be an n now comes the question where what happened to newton's third law did we involve newton's third law so far in this discussion we did not in this discussion there was no third law required in this discussion there was no third law required so was the third the force the reaction force that the third law talks about was not present at this time? Was it dormant or something? What happened to the third, that reaction force that the third law talked about? In this case, where is that third law force? So in direction of M. In direction of, I see M does not have a direction. M is just a mass, it's the scalar. It's not oh, a so N. Uh, N. The in direction of N, there is a, Reaction. No, but I just explained to you the existence of N, existence of NG, how the NG came about, how N came about. N came about from the first law of Newton, not from the third law of Newton. The third law of Newton talks about something independent of the first two laws. Are you trying to say that, uh, okay, so chalo, uh, you are saying that this n is in a way representing the reaction also that the third law talks about is that what you're saying uh yes sir like okay. the mass uh, the mass fine, of the... fine. so I, I got it so let's move to the second case this is the second case in the second case this mass is falling at an acceleration a where is the third law reaction force Newton did not say that uh, this third law does not apply to the bodies that are accelerating. He said it is applied, it is applied universally to everything. So even on this mass, which is accelerating at an acceleration A, we just found out, we just found out here, right? So, yeah. So even on this mass, there must be For this mg force that we are we are sure is acting on this mass, where is the reaction force? Anybody? I'm surprised that in this class nobody is responsible. Force of inertia will be there, sir. Inertia. Sorry, re repeat that. It's an inertia force. Sir. It will be opposite acting. Below. Inertial forces are basically a kind of a pseudo forces. That is in a way just saying that M instead of saying that you are accelerating at M a acceleration or the your uh, mass multiplied by acceleration, that force is causing your acceleration of A. Instead of saying that, if you move to that A plane, let's say I have 
I'm standing here on a platform that is also falling at the same speed or same acceleration as this mass. Okay, I'm just following along with this mass. Then for me, there would not be any acceleration on this body. Then in order to explain that, they bring in this inertial force concept. So that's how this inertial force. So what you can say is that uh, since I'm on a, on a frame of, of reference, which is moving by acceleration A, so for everything in that frame, I will apply an inertial force of minus MA. Okay, so inertial force is nothing but your term MA here, which is just another way of saying it is accelerating by an acceleration A. Okay, no. Um, okay, so the Newton's third law, the reaction force that it talks about is not on the same body. So force MG is acting on this block downward. The reaction that Newton talked about in his third law is not going to act on the same body. That is never explained to us in our high school and that keeps confusing us for our life. What, which body is applying this MG force on this block? Dipsy? Who is applying this MG force on this block? Is it the table? Is it the ground or is it the earth? Earth, sir, earth. I had named Dipsy, yeah, come on. Dipsy, you want to respond? Yes, sir. Yeah, which one? MG is because the of the weight of the body, right, sir? Yes, it's weight of the body, but who is applying that force? The body itself. No, body itself cannot apply force on itself. Gravity. No, uh, no, it's because of the, yeah, it's because of the gravity, but uh, that body is applying that MG force on the ground, I think. No, not on the ground. You have to differentiate between the ground. See, ground means ground surface. See, uh, when the, let's say I drop this weight from a height and it is falling towards the earth, towards the ground. It is on the way. Even then this MG is acting. Who is applying this MG force on this body? It cannot apply that force on itself. One second, let her answer. I'm waiting for her. Yeah, earth only, sir, then. Yes. So, there is a big mass of earth sitting under it, not right under it, below it at some distance. And this is the center of mass of the earth. This is the center of the mass of earth. This is applying this force NG remotely from a distance because the gravity waves or gravity field uh, can cover a large, a large distance. So all this area is covered by gravity. Okay. And anything in that field is being pulled by a force MG. Now, Newton's third law says that if this body is applying a force mg on, if this body is applying a force of mg on this body, then this body will be applying a opposite force on this body. How much? Exact same, but opposite. So the Newton's third law reaction that we were talking about is here on the earth that we never have to worry about because that force is so tiny for the big mass of earth. Things don't get disturbed so much, so we not talk. We don't talk about it. <clears throat> okay. And then Newton's first law had also told us that there is an n force acting here, because if this n was not acting here, this body would have started falling, and we know that it is not falling. That means there must be an n acting here. And why was it? Why was it acting here? Because it was sitting on a table. So it is sitting on a table. The uh, mg is acting. I'm not drawing them exactly and the aligned so that I can show it clearly, but you understand that these are aligned, right? These two forces are aligned. So NG is acting, N is acting, and we found the reaction force for NG, which is acting on the earth, right? So on this block, NG is acting this way. On the earth, at the center of the earth, you can say, or every particle of the earth, there is NG acting upward, fine? Now, that means N is not the reaction of Mg that Newton talk, talked about in the third law. That means this N is an independent separate force. And if that is the case, where is the reaction of N? Because Newton said every force will have its own reaction. There will be reaction couple. 
So Mg and N are not each other's reactions that Newton talked about in the third law. Mg's reaction is here. Where, then where is N's reaction? No, on all the of you should be able to answer boundary. this one. On the? Boundary. Boundary, like uh, Like the like flat surface. Sir. Flat surface, the table, whatever. Very good, Vishal. So what is happening here is that if I can draw very closely, let's say there is some gap here, just so that I can draw it more comfortably. The table is applying this N force to the block and the block is applying this N force to the table. And these two are opposing each other. These two are on opposite bodies, on the two reciprocal bodies, acting in opposite directions. Okay, so this N will be opposite of this N. And these will never be acting on the same body. Be very, very careful. When you, whenever you think of Newton's third law, if one body is applying a force to the other body, the other body will apply the reaction force to the first body. The action and reaction will not be acting on the same body. Okay? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. So, <clears throat> when I say, if I have a rod, steel rod, let's say, I'm applying a force G here. Okay. Am I, what kind of force is this for this rod? Actual force. Actual force? Be careful. I mean, uh, I understand that it looks like an actual force. And, uh, and somebody else was also trying to answer. Uh, tensile force. Tensile force. Actual is uh, tensile is basically one special type of actual force. So pull. Be pull. Yeah. So tensile. Another word for is pull. Right. Be mindful that I have not drawn this force here, here yet. Okay. It's not a thing. Is it still a tension force? No, sir. No, sir. No. What is it? I have not given any boundary conditions, anything. Okay. It is just an external force acting right in the rightward direction on this body. Okay. You cannot call it tension yet. You can call it a tension. Let's say I apply a 20 kilonewton force this way. And then I apply 10 kilonewton force on this way. Okay, this is a bar hanging in space. And I apply these forces on this body. How much is the tension in this body? What will happen to this body, first of all? This is this bar hanging in the space. I apply 20 kilonewton here, 10 kilonewton here. What will happen to this body? Body will move, sir. It will move, it will right? Move in the in the direction of 20 kilonewton, okay? It will accelerate in that direction. Fine. Okay, there will be non-zero acceleration in that direction. Now, if I ask you, how much is the tension acting on this body? What is the tension acting on this body? To be the difference between them. Yes. So the difference between them will be the uniform, like that will be present everywhere. So you can call that much is the tension on this body. That is 10 kilonewton. No, not the difference. Why, why the difference? Sorry, this 10 kilonewton, what is the smallest one, smaller one? Because the remaining balance is causing the acceleration. But 10 out, 10 out of 20, so if this was, let's say, 5. So 15 kilonewton is causing the acceleration. The 5 kilonewton is balanced, so the tension is 5 kilonewton. Okay? All right. Yes, sir. Um, so, likewise, let's say I have this body. I apply a moment like so, this one. Okay, let's call it in there. Or I have a bar or a beam, rather. Let me take a beam. 
I have a beam. I apply moment. What is the bending moment in this beam? What is the direction of the bending moment in this beam? Is it a hogging moment, sagging moment? Hogging moment, sagging moment, sag. Sagging, sagging. sagging. How much will be the bending moment? The beam will just rotate. Sir, so it's actually boundary conditions are not given, so just rotate. Yes. So, what will be the bending moment? It says beam hanging in the space, just floating in the space. I apply this moment on this one. Zero. Sorry, zero. Zero. So, so, bending moment is zero. Whether it is hogging or sagging doesn't matter because it is zero. So, no, no moment means no sagging, no hogging. Okay. Until I apply another moment on the opposite direction. When I apply these two moments, then this thing you can say is in a sagging moment. Okay. Fine. So whenever we see, we say sagging moment or moment, bending moment, sorry. So sagging moment is a type of a bending moment. It is not a moment. So whenever C, we say bending moment. This much of bending moment. Or whenever we say this much of tensile or axial force. Whenever we see, we say shear force. Oh, I'm running out of time. What is what do I automatically mean? There is something I implicitly mean here. In all three cases. Versus if I say force, moment, force. So in these three cases, I mean something else implicitly, which I, I don't mean when I say this. What it means here is that these are balanced or in equilibrium. All right. Equilibrium. OK, and what I'm saying is that when I say tensile force, I mean there is a T being applied here and T being applied here. Then you can call it a tensile force. If only T is applying here, then you cannot call it a tensile force. You can only call it a force. Likewise, if I have a body, I apply a force like this. This is not a shear force on its own until I apply a balancing set of forces. Then you can call it a shear force. This is balancing it. This is balancing it. Okay. So then it is a shear force. Without this balancing act, only this much, it's just a force. Okay. And in the next class, we will talk about the sign convention for this. I think you guys have another class after this. Sorry to keep you waiting. All right, so I'll discontinue today's class now. We'll continue in the next class. OK? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you sir. sir.